This is essential knowledge for anyone who is planning to invest some of their money in order to build wealth. You should not invest a dime without knowing this. Hello and welcome to Practical Personal Finance, where you get the information you need to understand and succeed with money. I'm Andrew Shear, and understanding how capital gains taxes work will help you invest strategically so you can become wealthy. That's why today I'm going to help you understand what capital gains are, how they're taxed, and how they can be offset by something called capital losses. Make sure you stick around until the end when I'll tell you about three exceptions to capital gains tax that wealthy Americans are constantly using to reduce the amount they need to pay Uncle Sam. If you're ready to learn this essential knowledge, then give this video a thumbs up. And if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. You're about to learn something new about money. Before I start talking about capital gains tax, I think it's important to discuss capital gains themselves. To put it simply, a capital gain is money you earn when you sell an asset. When I say asset, I'm primarily talking about investments in the stock market and real estate. Now, there are other types of assets like cars, art, and collectibles. But when it comes to capital gains tax, those all have some specialized rules attached to them. So for this video, I'm just going to focus on the first two I mentioned investments in the stock market, and real estate. To calculate capital gains, you just need to follow this simple formula. The amount you sold an asset for minus your basis, or the amount you purchased that asset for. The difference between those two amounts is your capital gain. If you own an asset that has gone up in value since you bought it, but you haven't sold it yet, that increase in value is called unrealized gains. When you sell that asset and cash out, the gains have now been realized. As an example, let's say I bought some stock in Google for $100. This is my basis. Five years later, I noticed that I have some unrealized gains. My Google stock is now worth $350. I decide now's the time to sell and realize those gains. Someone pays me $350 for that Google stock. To calculate my capital gains, I take the amount I sold the stock for $350 and subtract my basis, $100. The result is a capital gain of $250. Now that you have a good understanding of what a capital gain is, let's talk about capital gains tax. Whenever you sell stocks or real estate and make a profit, Uncle Sam is going to want to take a cut. That cut is called capital gains tax. There are two types of capital gains tax short-term and long-term. If you sell an asset that you've owned for one year or less, you'll be paying short-term capital gains tax. If you sell an asset that you've owned for more than a year, you'll be paying long-term capital gains tax. Short-term capital gains tax is more expensive than long-term capital gains tax. The reason for the difference is because when you have people constantly buying and selling stocks or real estate, it causes volatility in the markets. Prices go up and down all over the place. There's no stability. So by taxing short-term capital gains at a higher rate than long-term capital gains, the government encourages people to purchase assets and hold on to them, contributing to a more stable market for that particular asset. Your short-term capital gains tax rate is equal to your regular federal income tax rate. So if you're in the 32% tax bracket, your short-term capital gains are getting taxed at 32%. For example, let's say I bought some Tesla stock six months ago for $50. Tesla has really been shooting up in value lately, and now my stock is valued at $250. I decide it's time to sell and realize my gain of $200. Because I've only owned that stock for six months, I'm going to have to pay short-term capital gains tax on my profits. I'm in the 32% federal income tax bracket, so my short-term capital gains tax rate is 32%. When I take 32% of $200, I get $64 in capital gains tax. So my actual profit after paying the capital gains tax would be just $136. Long-term capital gains taxes are also dependent on your income. 
Historically, the top long-term capital gains tax rates have been as high as 77% just before World War I. They have also been as low as 12.5% in the years leading up to the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. For the past 25 years though, things have been pretty stable. The top long-term capital gains tax rates have been somewhere between 15% and 24%. Right now, if you make less than $40,000 per year, your long-term capital gains tax rate is 0%. That's right, zero. If you make between $40,001 and $441,450 per year, your long-term capital gains tax rate is 15%. And if you earn more than $441,451 per year, your long-term capital gains tax rate is 20%. The numbers are a little bit different if you're married, but they're still in the same ballpark, as you can see here. Let's see an example of long-term capital gains tax in action. This time, let's say I bought that Tesla stock 18 months ago for $50. It's gone up in value a little more slowly this time, but now that stock is worth $250, just like before. I decide it's time to sell and realize my gain of $200. Because I've owned that stock for over a year this time, I'll be paying long-term capital gains tax on my profits. My income hasn't changed. I'm still in that same federal income tax bracket, but my long-term capital gains tax rate will be just 15%. When I take 15% of $200, I get $30 in capital gains tax. So after tax, I'm left with $170 quite a bit more than what I wound up with earlier, when I took home just $136. There are two more important points you should know about capital gains taxes before we move on. First, in addition to federal capital gains tax, you may also be subject to state capital gains tax. Different states have different capital gains tax rates, and you could end up paying quite a bit more depending on where you live. And second, if your income is more than $200,000 as a single filer, or $250,000 as a couple, you'll be subject to an additional tax on capital gains called a Net Investment Income Tax, or NIIT. The NIIT tax on an additional 3.8% to whatever your capital gains tax rate is. This additional tax was introduced in 2013 to increase tax revenue. It may not surprise you to learn that 70% of all capital gains taxes are paid by the wealthiest 1% of Americans. All right, so we've covered capital gains and capital gains taxes. What if you bought a stock and it went down in value before you sold it? If you lose money on an investment and cut your losses by selling, it's called a capital loss. As an example, let's say I bought some Google stock for $350, but six months later, the stock market took a dive and the value of my Google stock went down to just $250. I decide to cut my losses and sell my stock. To calculate my capital loss, I take the amount I sold the stock for, $250, and I subtract the amount I purchased the stock for, $350. The result is a $100 capital loss. It's a shame that I lost some money on my investment, but it's not all bad news. Capital losses can be very useful because they have the ability to offset capital gains. Let's say I had that $100 capital loss from my Google stock, but I also had some capital gains from some Tesla stock that went up in value by $150. I take my capital gain of $150 and subtract my capital loss of $100, and I'm left with a capital gain of just $50. Now I owe quite a bit less in taxes. Capital losses can also be used to offset regular income, although you're limited to just $3,000 per year. But don't worry, if you have more capital losses than you're able to deduct in a given year, you can simply carry them forward to the following year. They're truly a gift that keeps on giving. There's one more thing you should know about capital losses, and it's a strategy called tax loss harvesting. Here's how it works. Let's say you have capital gains of $100 that you're going to have to pay $25 in short-term capital gains tax on. You've also got some Microsoft stock that has gone down in value by $100 since you bought it. So you sell that Microsoft stock, realizing a $100 capital loss. That capital loss offsets your $100 capital gain, so you no longer owe any capital gains tax. 
and then you immediately buy some IBM stock for what you sold your Microsoft stock for. You end up in just about the same position as before. You've got some shares of IBM instead of Microsoft, but they're pretty similar. And guess what? Now you don't owe any capital gains tax. This is a strategy that the wealthy use to reduce their tax liability when their assets go down in value. So keep it in mind next time certain pieces of your portfolio aren't doing so well. You could replace them with similar investments and reap the rewards come tax time. Before I wrap this one up, I want to talk about three exceptions to capital gains tax that you should absolutely be aware of. These are the kinds of tax planning strategies that wealthy Americans take advantage of every single day. And you should too. Number one is retirement accounts. I'm talking about everything from your 401k to your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA. Before tax, after tax, it doesn't matter. Money inside of your retirement accounts is not subject to capital gains tax, period. End of story. You can buy and sell investments with money inside of those accounts, and regardless of how much those investments earn, you'll never pay a penny of capital gains tax. Number two is your primary residence. Let's say you wanna sell your home that you've been living in. If you're single, you'll be exempt from capital gains tax on $250,000 of profit from the sale of your home. And if you're a married couple, you get a $500,000 exemption. So you go ahead and sell your primary residence for, say, $200,000 more than you originally bought it for. Despite those capital gains, you won't owe any capital gains tax. As long as you've used the property as your primary residence for two of the past five years, you're in the clear. Number three is something called step up in basis. And it's one of the biggest tax loopholes in existence. Let's say you've spent your entire life investing in the stock market and your investment portfolio is now worth tens of millions of dollars. If you cashed out and sold them all, you'd owe millions in capital gains taxes. So you hold on to them. When you die, all of those investments are passed on to your heirs. And the amount you bought them for, your basis, gets stepped up to their current value. So your heirs could immediately sell all of those investments and pay absolutely no capital gains tax. This is how vast amounts of wealth gets passed down from generation to generation in America. And you should be taking advantage of it, just like the wealthy are. Do you think that step up in basis should be eliminated? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, click right here to learn more about the differences between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. And if you're not already a PPF subscriber, you're totally missing out. Click right here to change that. Thanks for watching. I'm Andrew Shear, and I'll see you next time.